Hi, it's Greg Dalton. I'd like to hear your comments on the show, topics we should cover, and guest suggestions. You can reach me at greg at climateone.org. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. In 2020, the California utility Pacific Gas and Electric pleaded guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter for deaths resulting from a failed power line. But not one person from PG&E served time. This wasn't a financial crime or, or you know, a, a white-collar crime that was victimless. I mean, these are, these are homicide charges. Also in 2020, PG&E hired a new CEO who promised to take one of the country's largest utilities in a new direction. What we have to do is stay focused on the future and what we can do to make the system safer. Throughout the country, utilities face the challenge of revamping an electric grid that has not changed much since the time of Thomas Edison. What I get excited about is imagining what that grid of the future is going to look like And we need to make sure that we are investing in that. Reinventing utilities during a climate emergency. Up next on Climate One. In 2006, Pacific Gas and Electric was perceived to be one of the most progressive utilities in the country. They supported California's landmark climate law AB 32. And a few years later, quit the U.S. Chamber of Commerce over its opposition to climate action. Since then, a string of self-imposed disasters has damaged the company's image and public trust. A company gas line exploded south of San Francisco, killing eight people. And failure of PG&E equipment caused a rash of deadly wildfires named Butte, Camp, Kincaid, and Dixie, killing 91 people and burning nearly 1.5 million acres. The company's 2019 bankruptcy was one of the largest ever in U.S. history, and seen as the first corporate bankruptcy driven by climate disruption. Later in this episode, we'll hear directly from the current CEO, Patty Poppy, about the past, present, and future of the utility giant and the future of fossil and renewable power throughout the country. But before we get to my conversation with Patty Poppy, I invited Catherine Blunt, a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, to give us some historical perspective on the company that powers much of the world's fifth largest economy. In 2018, the campfire killed 86 people in and around Paradise, California. Blunt wrote that the county district attorney, Mike Ramsey, ordered the transmission tower that ignited that fire to be treated as a crime scene. I asked her why she thought he did that, rather than chalk it up as a natural disaster or accident. Very shortly after the campfire ignited, um, there was a PG&E helicopter seen around the tower. Um, so there were supervisors who'd ordered um, emergency patrol of, of that particular line because earlier in the day, shortly before the campfire was reported, they'd recorded an outage on that line and they wanted to go see if there were any issues. And the, the troublemen who they dispatched to go to that tower did see that there was an abnormality in the sense that you know, the part of the line had failed. So then after uh, that inspection by PG&E, a few hours later, uh, a CAL FIRE crew made their way over there and saw the same thing, um, shared their findings with the district attorney. And he said, well, you know, if there was an indicate, if there was a problem on this line, uh, there, there's a, a, a good indication that it could be implicated in the ignition of the fire. And we should, we should take this pretty seriously. In 2020, PG&E pleaded guilty to 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter. Did anyone serve time as they would presumably do if the guilty party were an individual rather than a corporation? No, no, nobody served time. And to, to consider that, um, it, it, it's, uh, it really speaks to this, um, kind of difficult to understand and convoluted world of, of corporate liability. You know, this wasn't a financial crime or, or you know, a, a white collar crime that was victimless. I mean, these are these are homicide charges. And it's kind of remarkable to consider the process that the prosecutors had to go through to convict the company on these charges. The thing about a company like PG&E is that it, it is so it is so large. You know, there's a great deal of diffusion of responsibility in terms of you know who manages what, who makes decisions, who knows what. You know, do do what do the executives know? What do the middle level managers know? What do the inspectors know? And in terms of pursuit of criminal charges, it's on the prosecutors to prove knowledge and intent. I mean, that is that is the basis of you know this crime and, and many others. And so what they were able to prove was that. 
many employees of the company did have knowledge of the risks uh, inherent within the transmission system. They had knowledge that they weren't you know, doing adequate inspections. But in terms of you know, who made that choice, who did what, um, that's where you know, that diffusion becomes many layers of plausible deniability, many layers of decision making. And you know, for that reason, they didn't feel they could bring charges against any one individual but rather, you know, there were individuals who did know and, you know, who could, I mean, kind of collectively being said to have intended to do this, but it's not, you can't pin it on any one person and certainly not some of the executives who were too far removed from that granular decision making that resulted in the failure of the, of the hook that um, dropped the wire that ignited the fire. So it's a complicated, it's a complicated space and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly frustrating, I think, for many observers who want to see some, you know, greater level of, of personal responsibility of those within the company. But from a strictly legal standpoint, that's that's very, very hard to come by. So it sounds like the company is a serial killer. Maybe that's a little strong, but certainly multiple have been prosecuted twice for, for killing p- innocent people. And it doesn't sound like uh, there's a deterrent of having individual accountability to prevent this from happening again. Well, what's remarkable is that, you know, to to your point, yes, this is the company's second conviction, second felony conviction after a disaster that that killed a number of people. The first was after um, a pipeline explosion south of San Francisco in 2010 that killed eight people. And in both cases, you know, it's for for these crimes, right? In In the case of the pipeline explosion, it was violating the Federal Pipeline Safety Act. In the case of the campfire, it was involuntary manslaughter. The statutory maximum fines for these crimes are just a few million dollars. And so just from a strictly financial standpoint, it has next to no effect on a company this size. And so, you know, in both cases, prosecutors had initially pushed to try to seek larger fines from the company, but that proved really difficult. And so ultimately the company kind of the, the fine aspect of the whole thing is nothing more than a slap on the wrist. And of course, this is it causes you know pretty serious reputational damage. But for a utility, it's not like the customers have a choice. You know, after the, the company is convicted, you can't say, "Well, I'm not going to do business with that company anymore." You 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 have to. And it may be hard for p- many people to fathom these days, but once upon a time, I've been covering this long enough, the PG&E was a highly respected institution. It was one of the most progressive, cleanest, most climate-friendly utilities in the country. You know, So how did pg e go from being this climate leader and relatively progressive utility uh, to being where they are now, to being this you know, twice convicted murderer? Well, that's a that's a really interesting question. And to understand the story holistically, I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that PG&E actually has done a lot of great work on, on climate issues over the years. PG&E, over more than a decade, procured a huge amount of, of wind and solar before a lot of other utilities were doing so. And in doing that, helped create the economies of scale needed to drive down the cost of future projects. Now, there's some irony here in a couple of ways. One thing that is ironic is in thinking about climate long term, the company kind of failed to recognize the extent to which its Northern California service territory was changing in part as a result of climate change. So there were a couple of periods of really severe drought that were made worse by climate change. You know, they're hotter, longer, and really stressed the forests in terms of hydration and creating an environment in which, you know, invasive pests killed millions of trees. Um, so the consequence of a single spark became much higher over the course of a relatively short period of time. The other thing is that in procuring wind and solar relatively early, you know, some of these early contracts were, were pretty expensive. And so that was a, a cost ultimately borne by customers and later on created some some pressure within the company to keep certain expenses low. And some of those expenses included the kinds of maintenance and inspection work that would make the system safer. How about now? How is the company, you know, they brought in this new CEO, Patty Poppy. What are they doing differently now? So after what's transpired over the last few years, you know, first a really, um, a fire siege in 2017 that destroyed a lot of the wine country areas in Napa and Sonoma. Um, Of course, the campfire of 2018, the conviction that resulted of that. Those within the company are well aware of the risk. And I don't, the extent of the risk and 
what can be done about it in a way that may not have been consistently true over the last couple of decades. Now, you mentioned the new CEO. She's been really fascinating to watch as a leader. Shortly after she joined the company last year, you know, in July, a tree fell on a distribution line very close to Paradise, which was destroyed in the campfire. It ultimately ignited the second largest fire in California history. The company actually took a really long time to respond to the outage that they recorded on the line that caused the the fire. Um, Cal Fire was pretty critical of that in its ultimate you know report on on what transpired to allow this fire to to blaze out of control in the way that it did. And after that, she made a a fascinating executive decision in which she said, we're going to bury 10,000 miles of distribution wire. She basically looked across the service territory and said, it's just too much risk to manage. You know, this there's millions of trees. We have to have eyes on them all the time. It's just kind of like Sisyphus rolling the rock up the hill, right? You clear the tree and it grows back and it has to be done year in and year out. I think theoretically it's a great idea. There's just a lot of challenges associated with it. There's engineering challenges, labor challenges, and um, cost management at a time when the company has to do a lot of other safety work at a time when rates are very high to begin with. I actually live on a road where that that undergrounding is happening. So I've been watching that happen in a wooded area north of San Francisco. Uh, I can see, you know, how much time it takes and how much money it, it must be costing, you know, millions of dollars per mile. Skeptics might say that that undergrounding is a good way for a utility to make money because it increased their cost basis. They get uh, rewarded by deploying capital. So is this a money-making uh, move on the part of the company, the more capital they deploy, the more they get to right. increase their rates. They put it into their rate base, right? So is this that's, just- That's a- absolutely true. So there's no question that this is a big capital project on which they will earn a return. Utilities earn an authorized rate of return on, on large capital investments, building new power lines, You know, in some cases, building power plants if they're allowed to do that. Undergrounding, as we're speaking about, about right now, they do not earn those returns on what are considered operations and maintenance expenses, which is basically just day-to-day programs, keeping pipelines and power lines running, you know, little little projects to go replace certain parts here and there on any given piece of infrastructure. And so what unfortunately happens is that utilities will maybe cut corners on O&M where they're not earning returns and use that additional money saved to invest in large capital projects. O and M being sorry, yeah, operations, operations and, maintenance. and maintenance. Yeah, the sort of the yeah. bo- bo- boring stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, in an ideal world, the private interest and public interest can be balanced. It's a, it is a hard balance to strike, and not every utility has done it well. And PG and E, it seems, over the last twenty years, has done it exceptionally poorly. So. I want to pick up a little bit on on the bankruptcy. This is one of the top five bankruptcies in the country, just under uh, General Motors uh, bankruptcy, around $70 billion, one of the largest bankruptcies in U.S. history. How did the fire victims compare to the hedge funds and investors? Man, this was a challenging bankruptcy, and there were um, you know, interesting winners and losers. And I think you could really argue that the the fire victims very much got the short end of the stick in this one. So what happened Partly because was, they took stock. They took stock as part of the deal. Yeah, I mean, the the attorneys negotiating on their behalf ultimately negotiated a deal that did involve, yeah, shares in the companies. There were a lot of financial players involved in this reorganization that they they gained a lot financially, or at least something, or at least didn't lose anything. Now, some of the fire victims really lost everything and are still waiting on total, you know, the full compensation of the value of their claims. So there was a lot of... A lot of victims are really upset. I mean, just in principle, having to indirectly own shares in this company. And there's a certain irony, right? I mean, victims of of past fires are kind of bearing the risk of future fires by virtue of the fact that the value of their compensation, their prospect for compensation is tied to the value of the company's share price, which, you know, depends on investor perception of risk. And so there was a lot of sadness within the fire victim community about this. And you know, the, the trust is working hard to, you know, liquidate the stock best it can and to make cash distribution payments and to work through just the, com- the complexities of managing this trust. But it has been a slow process. How was this process for you writing this story? One of the sort of great kind of um, corporate stories of recent years. Uh, how was it for you when when you connected with fire victims? Was there a time you just like, wow, 
you know, how was this emotional journey for you here on Climate One? I should yeah. say we try to bridge that personal and systemic. I see you. I see yeah. you were f- affected by this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, having to you know s- to just really walk through exactly what happened the night of a particular 2017 fire in which one victim who I include, you know, f- fled his house. And the fact that one thing that really got me was his, um, his son of all things, as they were driving away, had forgotten to save, um, a teddy bear that had been in the family for a long time. And he just, all that's all he could think about. And, um, you know, of course it didn't survive, you know, but it's just like the, those little details of, of, you know, what people think about in the, in the throes of, of crisis, especially, you know, a nine-year-old child, who awoke to his house on fire. You know, I mean, there was, there were times in which I was writing and editing that chapter in which I I had to take, I had to, I had to break. I was, I was pretty emotionally uh, touched by that in a, in a very sad way. You quote Mark Noel, who successfully prosecuted PG&E for its role in the 2018 campfire. Quote, we made history, he said, shortly after the Dixie fire ignited a few years later. That's just after Patty Poppy became CEO. And he continued, quote, but we didn't change an effing thing. To what extent That's Mark for you. <laughs> yeah. to what extent do you agree with Mark Knoll? So just, you know, by, by way of context. So, you know, Mark was pretty uh, instrumental in prosecuting the campfire case. The company pleads guilty to the 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter in June of 2020. You know, 13 months later, all of a sudden he's requesting documents again. Right, he's requesting documents related to just to, to, to distribution, and you know I think that the the conviction ultimately on those involuntary manslaughter counts it it changed a few things. I think it you know it helped those who remained with the company after all of this to kind of understand better understand the risks, better understand the consequences of their actions. Certainly, you know it it made it so that. Any executive either coming in or who remains probably reoriented their thinking. But I think his overall point is that this sort of conviction doesn't eliminate the risk. It doesn't, it doesn't eliminate the risk. Catherine Blunt's a reporter at the Wall Street Journal and author of California Burning, the Fall of Pacific Gas and Electric and What It Means for America's Power Grid. Catherine, thanks for sharing your personal story and the stories of PG&E and the people affected by its fires. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed the conversation. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about PG&E and reinventing utilities during the climate emergency. Coming up, Patty Poppy, CEO of PG&E, lays out her vision for moving the U.S. economy away from fossil fuels to cleaner power. As we transition to a carbon-free economy and a carbon-free energy system, we do it in an optimized way. And until now, I think we've been doing it in a suboptimized way, partly because energy companies like PG&E have been resistant to sort of share the space. We need to share the space. That's up next when Climate One continues. As the CEO of PG&E, Patty Poppy is charged with navigating the company through massive wildfires, disrupted energy markets, and lingering public distrust of the utility. The company is undergrounding 10,000 miles of electric lines, working with GM and Ford on incorporating EV batteries into homes and the grid, deploying batteries at large power plants, and pushing to change net metering rates that pay homeowners for electricity generated on their roofs. In 2016, PG&E was put on probation after being convicted for a fatal pipeline explosion. During that probationary period, the company's equipment ignited fires that killed 91 people. The judge overseeing PG&E's probation said the company, quote, has gone on a crime spree and will emerge from probation as a continuing menace to California. Crime spree and menace. Those are strong words from a federal judge who knows the company deeply. In front of a live audience at the Commonwealth Club of California, I asked Poppy what she is doing to change one of the country's most prominent corporate criminals. Well, um, I came to fix it. I looked on from afar. I was previously the utility CEO, a CEO of a utility in Michigan, uh, actually in my hometown. Uh, I thought I had achieved my professional 
dreams come true. I lived uh, on the street where I grew up. My dad had retired from that company. Um, and I was so proud to lead that team in that company. And I thought I was, uh, had fulfilled my professional ambitions. And um, then I kept receiving calls to come to PG&E. I think a lot of people in the industry know me as an operator and one who leads with equal parts heart and head. And uh, I actually think that's what's required for PG&E right now. And so from afar, uh, I watched the challenging situation, the accelerating climate change, the effects it was having on people's lives, the devastation that was caused. I was heartbroken when I observed and watched um, both the, the San Bruno uh, explosion and its after effects, and then uh, obviously the wildfires that have been so devastating here in California. And so I came to make it right and to make it safe. And uh, I can tell you that the team that I am so proud to lead at PG&E gets up every single day to do exactly that. Well, last year in the aftermath of the Dixie Fire, you pledged to underground 10,000 miles of power lines or about an eighth of the overhead lines in your system. How quickly will that happen and how much will it cost? Yeah, well, a couple things. One, we're, we're ramping the plan right now, and so it'll be less than 10 years. Every, somebody somehow jumped to a 10-year conclusion, but it will be less than 10 years. We're already uh, making progress on that. This year, to date, we've already buried more lines than we buried all last year. But it's only like, what, 100 or 200 miles this, a in year? In the early years, and so we're going to ramp up to about 1,200 miles uh, a year uh, in the next four years. And... People ask about the cost all the time, and I want to frame up something. And, and Greg, I know you understand utility economics better than a lot of people, but it's a little complicated. But what I can tell you is today, what is expensive for customers is the fact that we spend $1.7 billion a year at PG&E trimming and removing trees from lines. That is an annual expense that our customers are bearing. By undergrounding the lines, though there's an upfront capital cost, the long-term maintenance expense on that and the 99 plus percent risk reduction makes it a very economic choice. Uh, there's estimates of about $3 million per mile. I guess you're saying that's coming down. So that gets put into to your rate base, right? Mm -hmm. Capital structure. Mm -hmm. So that's also good for the business, right? Because then you get a return on that capital, whereas you don't get the same return on cutting trees. Well, and it's good for customers. That's who it's good for because it spreads the cost out over a longer time and they get a permanent repair. One of the challenges I've discovered at PG&E is our financial structure is much over the years, maybe it's because of the challenges the company has faced, but it drifted to a heavy expense um, percentage. The best of the best utilities in the nation are at about a two to one capital to expense ratio because those are better permanent repairs for customers. It's actually, the utility is designed to invest in infrastructure. PG&E is at about a 0.9, which means for every dollar of expense, only 90 cents goes to capital uh, infrastructure, which means we are band-aiding as a practice. You're not as investing. Opposed, we're not investing, and people have said, PG&E didn't invest in the infrastructure. I agree, and we have to fix that. And so undergrounding actually becomes a very economic part of our reimagination of the grid. You've acknowledged that the company hasn't been you know, in touch with its customers. In 2020, nearly 5 million Americans received their electricity through a program called Community Choice Aggregation. These are local alternatives to mon monopoly utilities, and they exist in California, Illinois, New York, Ohio, and Virginia. They're actively being considered in Arizona, Colorado, and your former state, Michigan. The U.S. EPA says that these local power companies provide potentially lower costs, faster shift to greener power, local control of electricity generation, and expanded consumer choice, green local choice. What's your view on these local competitors, really? Yeah, well, they're not necessarily competitors. They're part Partly. of the fabric of the way we deliver energy in California. And I do think um, the big 
change that's going to happen for utilities and for energy providers and for the grid uh, is an opportunity as we decarbonize the economy is to have our hometown utilities play a very important air traffic control, if you will, in the grid. And we, because we don't make profit on the sale of energy, so a community choice aggregator doesn't actually affect our profitability. They're not competitors. They actually can be partners. And it might be better for us to deploy our dollars to the grid and allow those community choice aggregators, as we've supported, deliver energy in a different form. Now, I would argue that the energy that we do produce at PG&E is 93% GHG free, that which we delivered to customers last year. That might surprise people. But what I get excited about is imagining what that grid of the future is going to look like. And we need to make sure that we are investing in that. And so let me just give you an example. I know your family's from Michigan, Greg. And so maybe at one point or another, you traveled along I-80 in Iowa. Uh, and so when you think about I-80 in Iowa, it's a long, straight you know, thoroughfare with a few off ramps, a few on ramps. And that's a little bit like what the grid has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got one way flow of power from big bulk power stations onto that big super highway and off to some off ramps and then gets down to the little towns that surround the, the freeway. I imagine the grid of the future to look a lot, much, a lot more like downtown San Francisco. We're going to have multimodal energy forms and we need all of it. We need all of it. We need all of the clean energy that we can muster. We need to find a way to deliver it with one very important caveat, that as we transition to a carbon-free economy and a carbon-free energy system, we do it in an optimized way. And until now, I think we've been doing it in a sub-optimized way, partly because energy companies like PG&E have been resistant to sort of share the space, we need to share the space. And as we share the space, we can reinvent and reimagine how we distribute energy in these multimodal forms, but we have to optimize it. It can't be uh, kind of a fixed pie mindset where there's winners and there's losers. We need all of it, but we can, there are ways to do it that are the lowest societal cost. And I get pretty excited when I think about kind of being air traffic control for new forms of energy, optimizing the forms that we have today, and bringing the cleanest energy system to the people of California at the lowest cost. And we've, uh, our system has been to regulate those companies to be reliable and everywhere, not to be dynamic or entrepreneurial, like reliability, keep the lights on. That's like the base thing, not, yes. not to create new, new ways of delivering that energy. You know, PG&E is an investor owned utilities, you know, uh, though there's some questions now about whether investor owned utilities are the best sort of capital structure or model, right? You know, given that there's these other models out there, you know, what's the case for investor-owned utilities when there are some municipals and other ownership structures that have done pretty well serving their customers? Yeah, you know, I used to ask myself this very same question. You know, I spent the first 15 years of my career at General Motors in the automotive industry, and then I switched to the utility. So coming from a very hyper-competitive industry to a investor-owned utility. And I remember having to learn the finances. And I, I kept having meetings with these regulatory finance guys. And I'm like, wait, tell me one more time. <laughs> I don't understand. Doesn't profit minus expense equal, or doesn't revenue minus expense equal, equal profit? They're like, no, not here. It's a different <laughs> formula. So I really had to learn all that. And as I learned all of that, I realized that though we call them monopolies, because we have a monopoly that's designated in a geographic area, we do compete for capital. Mm -hmm. And an investor-owned utility, one of the advantages to the customers of an investor-owned utility is the transparency of our performance relative to peers. So I can tell you, we have to fill out a FERC Form 1 that tells all of our costs, and our investors make choices about where to deploy capital based on the most effectively operated utilities. So for customers, there actually is a real gauge of our effectiveness, both from the customer perspective, but from an investor perspective as well. And I do have to just make one pitch for investors. 
I think sometimes we think investors, we imagine these fat cats on Wall Street, you know, raking in the dough at the expense of the little guy. Let me tell you who the utility investor is. It is a mom and pop. It's probably all of the people who are here. Anybody who has a retirement fund is a utility investor. And utility investors do not expect profit maximization. Mm -hmm. They expect a steady, fair return and a good, safe dividend. And so from my perspective, that then does not put in conflict investors and customers. It actually puts them on the same side of the equation, both wanting the same outcome. That's well-served customers and a well-operated utility. And so for that reason, I think the investor-owned utility model has tons of advantages for the people that we serve. Some people who've been in California before you got here would say that PG&E cut corners to divert money to investors that didn't go to safety, and and that was partly some regulatory uh, problems. But there were, you know, there's an incentive to cut corners on safety if you're shareholder driven. And this is where I think our new leadership team is probably going to have the biggest impact at PG&E. When I went out to the market, so I was hired in in um, November of 2020, and I started January 1st. Well, I spent from November 2020 to January 1st recruiting a management team. All of the positions but for our general counsel and our, our chief financial officer were open, which ended up being a good thing. I didn't have to go through this evaluation phase. I could just bring in a great new team. And I was able to attract some of the top industry performers and industry leaders from the best, most well-run utilities in the nation. California, the people of California um, should be very grateful that these people came and have signed up for this challenge and this mission because we know what good looks like and what good looks like is customers are always first. There's never a trade-off between safety and profit. I can tell you 100% there is no contest. Safety is always first. The safety of my coworkers and the safety of our communities and the management team at PG&E is committed to proving that and proving and earning the trust and proving ourselves trustworthy by the people of California that we are here to serve. We know what good looks like and we're about implementing all of the processes and systems to make PG&E the safest utility in the world. So I believe you. I want to believe that you're, you're, you hired a great team. What happens when the, the next fire? If there, if there is, you know, odds are you've got a lot of lines and a lot of forests that are hot and dry, and there's a lot of fuel there. What happens then to the individuals that you're talking about and to the company? What, what happens next? Next time. Yeah, a couple things. First of all, there are a lot of positive signs about the progress we've already made. We uh, have taken some very significant actions in the last 18 months, one of which was implementing a system called an, uh, our Enhanced power, power Line Safety Settings. We call it EPSS. We have activated these settings and engineered our power lines in all of our high fire threat areas in addition to that additional, about a 10,000 additional miles adjacent to those high fire threat areas that if anything makes contact with those lines, they de-energize in less than a tenth of a second. And as a result, we've seen ignitions drop 80% year over year. And this year we're adding new technologies and new devices to get that 80 closer to 100. And that progress is real and it's happening. So that's thing one. But thing two, I'm going to tell you just a little story. Um, one of our new board members, we replaced the entire board too in 2020. One of our new board members is uh, a four-star admiral, Mark Ferguson, who was the chief naval officer for the U.S. Navy. Uh, he's been on a few missions, Greg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, one day when I was uh, coming to terms with risk and the hazards and the trauma that my coworkers have experienced and our customers have experienced. I called them. I just said, Mark, I need to know, how am I supposed to think about the risks that exist on this system and the hazard of things going wrong? And he said two things to me that I will never forget, and it really encouraged me. One was, 
He said, first, Patty, you have to ask yourself, is it safer because you're there? I said, well, yes, that's, uh, that it is getting it like, yes. And I know that our leadership team is making a huge difference for the people of California. And then he said, well, in that case, real leaders thrive in that environment. So I was like, oh, geez, okay, this is me thriving. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and then he said, and then he said, Patty, every great mission every great mission that was ever executed in the history of missions. And he said, you know, I have studied every military mission in the history of the world. He said, had two key fundamental attributes. One, they had setbacks. And two, they had leaders with resolve. And they had leaders who were unwilling to give up the mission because there was a setback. Well, let's hope that, uh, yeah. That that's, um, we'll see. You won't be rid of me very easily, Greg, is what I'm telling you. <laughs> We're sticking here until we close it up and we get the job done. You're listening to a conversation about the past, present, and future of the electric grid and renewable power with Patty Poppy, CEO of PG&E, one of the country's largest utilities. Coming up, how does the company answer for the pain it's caused by igniting deadly wildfires? One of the most important things to provide healing in a time like this for the people of paradise is that they can be safe at home again. That when the wind blows, they know that there will be no risk of a fire due to their power lines and they don't have to have a trade-off. That's up next when Climate One continues. Patty Poppy, CEO of the California utility PG&E, often talks about leading with love. I asked her where that empathy comes from, and does it have a place in running a Fortune 500 company? I think if more companies led with love, the world might just be a better place. Uh, companies can be a force for good. And uh, trust me, I get a few raised eyebrows uh, as I'm out in the field with my crews and at our power plants and People wonder, hey, lady, what's with this love business? But let me tell you something. We, um, we need more human in the equation of the work that we do. And I think born out of the Industrial Revolution, there's a mindset that work is work and life is life. And I believe that people bring their life to their work whether they want to or not. And if we can acknowledge the human experience of people who are doing very mission-critical, purpose-driven work, then we have a much higher likelihood of achieving our ambitions. And, you know, we just had um, several retirements at the end of June. And look, when you say goodbye to your dear friends that you've worked shoulder to shoulder with to change the world together, you can't tell me that you don't love them. And so let's just acknowledge that and create a space for people to be human while we do what we do. And I think people are safer then to be themselves, to bring their best ideas, to make a difference that's going to last, and to hold each other accountable. We, we had a, a, a leadership team meeting uh, earlier this week, and I was talking on the subject of leading with love. When you put your child in their back in the back seat of your car in their safety seat, you buckle the seatbelt. You would never pull out of the driveway without buckling your child in because you love them. When you're working on a job site with a coworker and you see them doing something unsafe, darn straight, you're going to say something because you love them. And when you acknowledge before something happens that there is love in this space, then you're going to do better work and it's going to be safer for our communities and for our coworkers. And having that leading with love you know, slogan, some of the fire victims have, have questioned whether you're, mm -hmm. you're leading with love and they've been traumatized, in many cases re-traumatized when litigation drags on and payments are not delivered as promised. And mm -hmm. to be clear, you don't control the victim compensation fund. That was part of a, the bankruptcy deal negotiated with the state, et, et cetera. Um, I'd like to play a clip and a question from one victim, Jess Mercer, who lost her family home in the Paradise Fire. 
My name is Jess Mercer. I lived and resided in Paradise, California for a majority of my adulthood. Uh, when I was 34 years old, unfortunately, on November 8th, 2018, my town burnt to the ground, consuming 94%. Uh, this included buildings, this included businesses, schools, homes, bikes, anything that you can think of that would be in a town that makes up the fabric of a town. Uh, personally, my father's home uh, burnt with everything in it. We did not retrieve anything from that loss. Uh, the night of the fire, I did receive my father. He's in his late seventies and upon getting him into my safe dwelling, he threw his keys out. And in that moment, I realized that that was one of the, the, the most parallel things that all of us still shared, regardless of where we went, is that most of us grabbed our keys, our phone or our wallet. Uh, so I did a call for art thinking that I could give those keys a new home, considering they no longer had entrance into a home or into that bike lock to go for a nice ride through the community or open a diary to tell their secrets that no one else would see. I constructed a Phoenix sculpture out of those keys that were engraved with initials and addresses and smiley faces uh, just to give us some hope that not only were we overcoming a fire from climate change and poor uh, poor caretaking of, of our equipment in our area in regards to electrical, but it's also a symbol of unity. And it took the thousands of people to come together to give the thousands of keys to stand tall once again. So the one main question that I have is the response that pg &E has done, not just in the physical equipment and underground lining, is what type of funding are you planning on putting forth for trauma-informed programs for the future generations of the community, those that did stay and their children that were highly affected, to lower their traumatic responses moving forward and to actually help propel them to have successful lives? I would just really like to know how that's going to happen. That's Jess Mercer, who lost her family home in Paradise uh, Fire. Patty Poppy, your response to Jess's story. Yeah, well, first of all, Jess, uh, if you're listening, um, that is a beautiful work of art, and I'm so sorry for everything you've been through. Um, I have a couple thoughts about this. Number one, one of the most important things to provide healing in a time like this for the people of paradise is that they can be safe at home again. That when the wind blows, they know that there will be no risk of a fire due to their power lines and they don't have to have a trade-off. And so the work that we're doing there to underground the lines was the precursor to us making the 10,000 mile commitment. And I think that is an important part of the healing for that community and the healing of the people. Um, I think Jess asks uh, an interesting question that we've been busy thinking about the infrastructure and what could we do to further assist our communities. We do a lot of work um, with a lot of organizations um, in a variety of areas supporting both post-disaster relief, during a disaster, during a public safety power shutoff emergency. Uh, I'm proud of how my team shows up in those um, moments, but I think it's uh, a, a good prompt for me to think about what can we do to help with the emotional healing of the children who experience such a traumatic ex uh, event. I, I can't, it's hard to fathom. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, Greg, I wear this ladybug on my shirt, suit, what have you, every day. <laughs> As a reminder. Pardon me. It's okay. Take a moment. About a girl named Fela, Fela McLeod, who... Um, was attempting to get out of uh, the Zog fire in 2020 when a tree fell on normally operating power lines. And uh, she died that day in the car with her mother. And I met with her family. And she loved ladybugs. And I promised her grandmother 
that we would work every day to make it right and make it safe. And do you, when you're talking to investors, do you think of Thela? Of course. And investors want us to. Investors' interests are aligned with our customers and our communities. They want a well-run, safe energy provider who is going to be part of not just fixing the infrastructure to not cause fires, but to actually thwart the root cause of climate change at its core. So I think of it like a tree. You know, at the branches, we have all our public safety prevention measures, the vegetation management, the, all of the inspections that we do, the extraordinary lengths we go to to make the system safe. But the trunk of the tree is the actual system itself and its reimagination, maybe not wireless power, but a lot less wires, whether they're underground or we've got distributed energy, that's at the trunk. But the root is the climate and what has changed, and we have to decarbonize the system as fast as we can at the lowest societal cost. And speaking about the root cause of climate change, pg e you know, has hydroelectric. It's pretty green relative to utilities in the country. Mm-hmm. We're in a situation where uh, there is a, a, a... What are you doing to use your platform profile within the industry to decarbonize because there's still some clinging to coal that's happening. We're not going to get much support from Congress or the Supreme Court right now. So it's kind of a moment where industry needs to lead and is industry going to go faster than it absolutely has to? You know, you might be surprised about this. Um, My peers across the, the industry are extraordinarily committed to decarbonizing the energy resources. When I was in Michigan, and so here I was, Michigan utility, I had total support to retire our coal plants. And we retired while I was there five uh, or seven of our 12. We had five remaining. Those dates have been set. Um, the, The company made even more aggressive ambitions to retire the coal faster since I left. The, the ambitions of the, the sector are pretty extraordinary, and the carbon reductions that have occurred in the nation have been predominantly driven by the transition away from coal in power generation. Mm-hmm. And in fact, mm-hmm. uh, just a few years ago, in 2018, the carbon emissions from power generation exceeded that of transportation. That's not true anymore. The greatest reductions have been made in the power sector. So I think you would find a willing group of very ambitious leaders actively pursuing the decarbonization of our generating fleet nationwide. And those companies actually sat on the sidelines when there was this case, West Virginia versus EPA recently, uh, where you know one state and some Republican governors, uh, attorney generals, you know, brought this case. Industry kind of sat on the sidelines, which was... Oh, there were several of us who, uh, several of my peers and I supported the EPA's position and and frankly, the ship has sailed. It's already happening. Coal's dying. Coal is dying. It's definitely, the, the economics even changed. It's not, it's, there's, not, um, there's not a future for coal. We've talked about the underinvestment in the grid and the need to modernize the grid. You know, the campfire that killed 80 people was started in part by a part that cost 56 cents in 1919. Uh, So what should be done to modernize the the electric grid? You know, I um, stood at the base of that transmission tower and I looked at that sea hook. Actually, I was on a cliff that was near it so I could actually see it. I wasn't at the base of the tower. I was up in the hills in the Feather River Canyon. And it occurred to me that those power lines at one time, when they were originally imagined and installed, were a pathway to prosperity for the people uh, in our rural communities and across the globe, but particularly, obviously, in California. And now they're a hazard. And as I stood there, I, you know, I thought about that sea hook, and it felt like a needle in a haystack. Like, how do you find that? But we have systems, we have processes, 
But I learned a concept in lean manufacturing in my early professional years and as an industrial engineer, eliminate the hazard. And in that case, that means eliminate the line. Challenge the notion that we need every one of those lines and instead use new technologies. And so I imagine Henry or, uh, Thomas Edison coming back today and frankly, he'd recognize most of the stuff. <laughs> it would be pretty familiar, exactly. but not for long. And as we deploy distributed energy resources, microgrids, as we underground the power lines, as we have resilient, redundant power supply that's mobile, when we deploy the full potential of electric vehicles to not just use power from the grid, but put it back on the grid when we need it, flex alerts become a thing of the past, that we have a resilient, reliable energy system that is clean and affordable, we actually get to do that right now. We get to do something that is we're disrupting ourselves and it is so exciting and you come from the auto industry i think one of the biggest positive changes in the last 10 years is the auto industry really getting serious about electrification so talk about the role of of cars in that transformation of the grid yeah i think they're essential um, in fact, we've PG and E. This is part of the fun of being a, a California uh, company leader. The people want to do business in California, and so we've been able to sign an agreement or make agreements with both General Motors and Ford. And we were already doing work with BMW to provide bi-directional charging, wherein the vehicle both powers the house and ultimately can power the grid. So I think a lot of people have heard about the Ford Lightning and Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, and I made a big announcement in Houston uh, last year, or in March uh, of this year, uh, that w the first Ford Lightnings would be plugged into the PG&E grid. And we're excited about that as a, I call it the triple stack of value, that it, certainly decarbonizing transportation is important, but imagine it as a resilience play powering your house and then on a hot summer day, it powers the grid. That changes the value proposition of an electric vehicle, and it changes the role of the interface between the electric vehicle and our grid. And we get to reimagine that. We, in fact, um, are working with Microsoft and Schneider Electric to optimize the system that can accelerate the distributed energy resources being optimized. It is such an exciting time for customers to have solutions that they want, the power the way they want it, and in a way that when we do it in an optimized way, where we have one system and real architecture to how all of these distributed resources interface one another, we can have a m much lower societal cost to decarbonizing our economy. And I think that is it's like the chance of a lifetime to have that kind of impact on the world and to lead the team who's gonna lead California through that transition is pretty exciting. And a big part of that transition in California is rooftop residential solar. Uh, the industry thinks, and a lot of people I know and, and respect think that PG&E is trying to strangle or, or you know, rooftop solar. Net metering was uh, a big debate in the state, and the state was about to make a decision, put it on hold. So how do you balance the need to pay for the grid People like me who have solar use it as a battery. We should pay a price. But the PG&E is trying to muscle in and try to really hurt rooftop solar deployment and the companies and jobs involved in that. I am so glad you asked me this question, Greg, because I want to set the record straight on a couple things. And I know you know this is a complex subject. It is. And just like I couldn't deny climate change with a sound bite, it's, you know... Um, improper. It's improper to boil this thing down to a sound bite. So if you'll permit me, I'm going to give you a little bit of an extended answer, but let me just share my thinking on this. And it might surprise people. First and foremost, the utility makes no profit on the sale of that energy. So there's no profit motive here. I just need to, and that surprises people and people think I'm not being accurate. Trust me. <laughs> I know. And the people who say that we are profit motivated in this and that we're fighting this because we're protecting profits are not correct. They are not correct when they say that. So let's just so so given the backdrop that I have not I do not have a profit motive in this argument. It gives me a pretty interesting vantage point to think about what is best for all customers. 
And let me make it simple. I'll try and say it in a plain way. Imagine there's two kinds of energy. One that's produced in, um, when the sun is shining and a different kind of energy that's produced when the sun is not shining. Think of them in buckets. So we have this bucket here in California that is full and overflowing with energy that can be produced by the sun mm -hmm. and while the sun is shining. In fact, on many days of the year, we have so much power that we can't use it all and we have to export it. It's free, negative pricing. So in that context, NEM worked. It was good policy. Did you hear me say that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. It was good policy at the time. Today, the price of that energy in that bucket, the price to make the equipment to produce that energy has dropped 70%. The incentive actually needs to shift. The incentive needs to fill up this other bucket because the other bucket is empty, not empty, but it's not, it's definitely not overflowing. So on the same day when you have free power because you have so much of it, it's overflowing the bucket. The other bucket, when you hit 8 p.m., does not have enough energy to serve the state. We need to invest in storage. We have flex alerts in the world's fifth largest economy. We cannot meet all our needs every day. That makes no sense. We have a, still a reliance on fossil fuel. We need to accelerate the retirement of fossil fuels. We still have prices rising when in fact prices are dropping of the power sources. This is an equation that can be solved, but it's not simple and you don't solve it with single solutions. You have to have optimized solutions. And because we are not profit motivated, because we do not have a profit dog in this fight, <laughs> people uh, would benefit from, from doing their homework, learning a little more about this issue, not being tempted by these simple sound bites that PG&E doesn't like solar, not true. PG&E loves solar, but we need to make sure we have distributed resources that are balanced with dispatchable resources like batteries. And there's a technology cost curve that's happening in batteries that makes us able to fill that bucket, particularly with the right incentives. And we can have a balanced, clean energy system that is reliable every day for California, but somebody's got to be air traffic control. And the interesting thing about the business construct for a utility, an investor-owned utility, is by design, from the earliest days, we were the ones expected to serve everyone. We are the provider of last resort. We are the ones who have to make sure it's fair. And that is why we don't have a profit motive. That's why it's designed that way, so that we can be agnostic to who produces the energy and where it comes from. We can choose and make sure that we make the best choices for the people of California to have an optimized, clean, affordable grid. I'm not sure I buy the not profit motive part, but by an investor owned utility. But but and it's a whole. We could have a whole conversation. And yes, I should to, come back. Let's we, do yeah, that. Yeah. Let's have another show we need about to have that. A, a net metering <laughs> whole whole <laughs> conversation. Let's give a round of thanks to Patty Poppy for coming here, doing a tough job <laughs> and an important time. Thank you, Greg. On this Climate One, we've been talking about the past and future of the electric grid and renewable power with Patty Poppy, CEO of the California utility Pacific Gas and Electric. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be difficult, sometimes depressing, and it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. You can help your friends and others have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basilia is our production manager. Our team also includes consulting producer Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.